we'll call you early birds, just to be better, you know, kind towards the others. That uh, session nine, it's already October, time just rolls by. Um, so I, this is just the same thing I provided last time, just reminding people that there's a link right here that goes to our Google folder and a link to the CGA page. I'll just leave these in there forever. Um, and basically, the, the only things that I had on the agenda today was um, covering some of the issues that we talked about last time. We, we talked about creating a Google form for tracking collective impact, just something you could quick, quickly fill out. Um, it, for example, what you share in a, in a little report to the group here might be something that would fill in one form, um, a learning activity or a lesson that you tried out. Um, so my report on that is, is I don't have it ready yet, but I, but we defined it last time that was clear. So it's just a matter of me getting the form assembled, um, making sure it's not, doesn't have typos in it. So I'll email that out, um, in the next couple of days after the meeting, and then we can, we can start using it from, from thence forward. Um, any questions about that? I think I put the... In addition to collecting curated resources and lesson plans and materials, like I talked about before, we will be using this form to collect the information just in a quick and easy but standardized format. So that'll be easy to kind of roll that information up and say, as a result of this project, this cohort did all this cool stuff with all these different students. Um, so, so we'll start using that um, from from this month forward. And like I said last time, I will make sure to kind of remind folks with each monthly meeting and um, even a lot like 10 minutes so that people can actually open it up, get it filled out, um, kind of get caught up and not have to worry about it another time. Uh, because I think as we get to this point in the school year, one of my general understandings is that you guys have a lot to do and it gets it starts to build up and get to a pace where it's hard to add additional things in. And I just wanna make it easy for you to stay on, on track with our um, collective work together and, um, and for, for me to get the little bit of information that I want without making it difficult for you. Hi, Lara. I'm sending slide link again. Hi, thank you. Sorry I'm late. Sure. No problem. You're you're middle level um early. We're calling you just regular on time. <laughs> um okay. So so just we were we were kind of just doing a soft start to the session reviewing. So what I was saying is the form that we're going to start using to to just capture information about what each um, one of you does with your students. I don't have that ready, but we'll send out the link and put it in the folder in the next um, few days. And and so just kind of wrapping up that topic for now. We're going to have some sharing later. Um, and I think now we've convinced Blanca to be a volunteer and also Renee. Renee's going to go first, Blanca second, but anybody else will we'll have some time for sharing. Um, I also wanted to follow up on our conference workshop or our, our conference participation in general. Um, I don't even know what the words on the screen are. Conference and professional learning workshops. Okay, conferences specifically in this case. So we have the CCSS, California Council for the Social Studies, um, proposal submission deadline has come and passed and we did submit two proposals. Um, and I'll go back over what the scope of that is. Um, that's the good news. Um, and I don't actually have, I don't think they have published a timeline for decisions. Um, so let's say I'm cautiously optimistic that they'll both be accepted, but um, you know, we don't know till we know. Um, we also won't know the exact uh, time schedule that we get. The Sunday is the only time that they allow longer workshops, two hour workshops. So because of that, 
I will never do a two hour workshop because I do not want to be scheduled on Sunday because conference attendance drops off a lot on a Sunday. And so I like, there's no point in that. Um, so, so by hopefully by submitting one hour workshops that kind of assures that we go on Friday or Saturday. So that's my hope. Um, but we're also only four days away from the California STEAM Symposium proposal deadline. On track for that, but um, what happened with the CCSS proposal submission, just to recap, um, and this is informational um, and not meant to put anybody on the spot, but uh, first of all, my mistake was that when we talked about it last time, I did not realize that every co-author needed to provide a bio and a headshot. But no problem, we had some time, so I sent out an email. Here's the draft of the, the session proposals. Please confirm that that's okay and give bios and headshots. Um, less than the full contingent met the deadline. I'm, no names need to be identified, but um, so we did actually submit the um, proposals, but instead of the full list of co-authors, only officially it's um, myself and Nicole thereby um, outing Nicole as uh, prompt and complete in her submission. Sorry, Nicole, to single you out that way. <laughs> um, but but thank you, because that at least made it a co-authored thing. And Renee has since provided a bio. Anybody else that um, intends, and I'll go back to another slide where, where we have our identified volunteers, but I will provide that information um, to CCSS, and I certainly will include you as co-presenters in the session, just like we planned. It's just for the purposes of review. I'm not sure whether or not they'll know or accept the addition of, of people. So um, no real change there. But the only reason I want to go over this right now is as a cautionary tale about the California STEAM Symposium, which has got proposals due on the 13th, which I kind of just today went, oh my goodness, that's four days away. Um, so I have the, the session proposals drafted, they're ready to go, but the same process, I'm going to send it out to everybody that's on the list, say, check this out. Um, and also I will say whatever I need from you as an individual co-author. Of course, now that I'm saying this, maybe they won't need anything and that'll be fine, but just heads up that if you're on that list, that I'm going to be sending you that email. So, um, I'm going to go forward, sorry for the skipping um but the the folks who agreed to be part of the session in ccss was at this time last month renee laura and nicole um and basically it's open still and so given that nicole and i are the official presenters we can definitely still add people and we have um funding if if somebody wanted to go. So if you're if you are a person who who wants to attend the social studies conference and hasn't spoken up, um, I, I did try and recruit some of you individually, though you might not the people I pressured might not be here. Um, it's in Burlingame, so that's like next to the San Francisco airport. So the location and the date obviously might make it possible, not possible. Lara, I know you, Lara, <laughs> I know you said it wasn't possible for you this year. Um, but uh, anybody else, it's, st it's still open. Um, and then going to the STEAM Symposium, Yuko and Nicole of the people here, right, are the ones who said you're going. So just heads up that in the next day or two, you'll be getting an email with me with the content of the proposals um, just for your feedback. And please do, don't be shy. Like, hey, I would propose you rewrite this paragraph this way. I, I would like that. I would include I'd it. love to go too. Okay, cool. <laughs> we, yes. And so same thing, still open. If the STEAM Symposium, in this case in San Diego, so again, check the, the date, check the um, the location. If that works for you, you can let me know um, and we will get in on, on this one as well. Same thing, we don't know until they accept our proposal. Um, I In both cases, I do the um, behind the scenes work to hopefully grease the wheels of, of bureaucracy and be like, you know us, right? We're the ones who are nice to you and talk up your conference and things like that. 
And um, certainly CJEF does a lot for CCSS. So I hope that that will be treated kindly in these review processes and we'll get to represent everything that we wanted to present. Um, okay, any questions about conferences? I see Michelle. Hello. Um, I am going, I'm trying to repost the link to the slides. So Tom, I, I just had a quick question for the Berlin game one. Yes. Uh, how soon would you need to know? I just need to check my dates to see if it interferes with one of my, uh, you know, those uh, online classes. But if it does not, wait, that's during the week, huh? It's uh, basically my recommendation would be to arrive on you're talking about CC. Oh, yes, CCS. The, the one oh, in Birmingham, because yeah, I could so drive there. My recommendation would be to arrive on Thursday evening um, and plan to be there Friday and Saturday, and then maybe have a contingency plan of like what happens if I find out that we present on Sunday. Um, and oh, your hotel and registration and things would be covered under the grant. Um, so to answer your question, maybe let's say like within a week. Okay, so I'll get back to you. I just have to make sure that it doesn't conflict with the online class. And if it does not, I'll let you know right away. It okay. would be nice to- As, At, at this point, the, the timing is mostly based on just being able to um, get the travel and the arrangements made before prices start to go up. Okay, well, for me, it would be just maybe a rent a car because I'm like driving oh. distance. Okay, all right. So I wouldn't be flying. Uh, maybe less time, but anyway, yeah. let's say we- Okay, I, I'll, get, I'll get back to you. Um, and that way I can, I can provide info to CCSS maybe before their, comp I, I imagine they just schedule one day where they have a committee come together and people have scored proposals and they decide that's all in my imagination. I don't know if that's how it happens, but anyway, um, so my thought is if we get them the information before that final decision, that, that could be at least taken into consideration. Um, Okay, so so we talked about conferences and we talked about um, the fact that we'll have the Google form ready to start capturing information. Um, you can do that as soon as the link's available and then we'll be kind of talking about it at subsequent meetings. Um, but speaking of subsequent meetings, what what um, does anybody know what November 13th is part of? It's a strange question, isn't it? Um, it's part of Geography Awareness Week. That falls right in the middle of Geography Awareness Week, which is, of course, my happiest week of the year. It's really no different than the other weeks. I'm pretty happy. Um, but I have some stuff going on, and I would like to propose we not have our regular meeting, and instead, you come to this. So um, I have I have been working on a couple of workshops, I think I mentioned this last time, Web webinars based on um, cool um, geocomputational applications that I've become aware of. So I was, uh, I got an email link to an article from um, The Conversation, which is an online um, magazine. And um, actually I can share the link to the story. Um, and it's, the, the lead author is this guy, Derek Alderman, who I know um, and who does kind of interesting. He's one of the few um, white geographers who I would say is an anti-racist um, scholar. Um, so that's um, pretty cool and makes him noteworthy. But, but also he's a Southerner working in a Southern university who's not afraid to speak up and be very much a public scholar. So he's somebody that I pay attention um, to what he's doing. And so this article is all about the way um, they're working to address the problem of offensive place names. And so uh, Derek Alderman is actually on a federal advisory committee that was created by um, the Interior Secretary, Deb Holland, who said, um, we're going to actually make a really concerted effort to rid the public lands, federal public lands of derogatory place names. And I can tell you um, they're there. It's kind of shocking if you've ever been in like, uh, even someplace like Yosemite that is certainly very widely and well known, you could stumble across a remote peak or um, canyon that has 
a shockingly derogatory name attached to it um and just think well, how did that get there and there's been a process for a long time where these names have been attached where certain groups of people have had the opportunity to attach these place names and they have chosen to try and reflect um discriminatory or racially dominant viewpoints uh in the landscape so that it would teach people of the future what they wanted them to know which is in my opinion um as long as those names are there you can guarantee america's a racist place uh you know how would it not be if um you didn't have these things going on so these uh so that's derek alderman's role he's been not only a member of this committee, he's the only geographer on it, and he's now like the, the lead author of the policies, like the guidelines for how this committee is gonna work. Um, he's done a lot of cool scholarship on civil rights commemoration um, and the struggle to get um, black civil rights leaders and just civil rights leaders in general uh, recognized through place names the way, for example, Confederate generals are zealously um, commemorated through place names or, you know, American revolutionary figures for that matter. So this, the other person is um, in Spain. So Daniel Otto Peralias is an economics professor who's really interested in the role of bias and inequality in economic systems and became um, interested in the way place names reflect bias in Spain. So things about gender um, in, inequality, uh, he's got um, a very cool database on the presence of names, that place names that are recognizing women versus men, not only how many, but where, and what's the process and when did they get created. Um, he's also looked at, um, religiosity in place names in Spain and the fact that you know 200 years after these place names were created they actually can see a difference in the amount of religious participation in people that live in communities where religious names dominate the landscape versus those that don't so very cool um research not just of finding these names so you can kind of out them and, and combat them, eradicate them, replace them, but also paying attention to the way those names actually are part of the landscape and actually are maybe the, the most legible, literally legible part of um, the landscape because people read the name, they say the name to each other, they use the name to reference it and they go, oh yeah, I know what you mean. Um, so Blanca, you have your hand up. Yeah, so I wanted to ask two questions. Well, one yeah. question and then share something. So the registration for this um, seminar is free? Yep. Okay. And my other question was, it was so interesting that this came up because our superintendent had just sent us something this week that Governor Newsom just signed AB 3074, which now we have to change our mascot, thank goodness, because we've been asking for that a long time. We are called the Braves. Mm -hmm. And so they're now this new law is saying uh, all, you know, K through 12, um, to 2028 to 2029, they have to change their mascots. It cannot be offensive. Okay. So I, I think we're moving in the right direction. Excellent. And um, so great question about being free. I never put that on there because I never charge for anything. Um, but I'm sure someday they'll change that and I'll charge for something. But for now, if I'm, if I'm offering something, it's always free because um, I, it's my, it's my idea that I would like you to attend and I would not like to make it. Um, Remember we're educators, Thomas. So we're a little poor too. So I'm, I'm very grateful that you're <laughs> offering it for free because when it's free, it's for me. Okay. Well, that it's not only going to be free, but it's awesome. It's not that like, oh, it's kind of like not so cool. It's free. This is going to be awesome. And so my idea was, um, like the theme for geography awareness week is geographers in action. So this to me is a geographer in action, um, happens to be along with an economist, but that's cool. Um, and this is geospatial technology. This subject of um, derogatory place names 
might not obviously appear to be an entry point for a geocomputational approach. But in fact, um, the way to combat it effectively is accelerated a thousand times if you apply a geocomputational approach. So this street names lab in, in Spain taps into open street maps, which has a database of every named street, not just in the US, but in the world. Um, if there's a street name, and then they go through and they, and they clean the database for their purposes, so the same street might might appear many times in OpenStreetMap if it's in different segments. And for the purposes of these folks, they're like unify all the segments, it's one name. If you change one name, all those change. So we don't need to think about it as 10, it's one. Um, and then also it turns out there's a lot of things, types of street names that they're like, it has no cultural content, therefore we're not interested. And I was like, huh, that's strange. And he mentioned that there's actually street names that are just symbols. And I was like, kind of baffled by that. And then he said, you know, like first street. And I was like, oh, duh. <laughs> like, he's like, first street's just a symbol. It's not, a, it's not a textual meaning. And I was like, ah, I get it. So that made perfect sense. They cleaned out all the first avenues, first streets, 122nd, whatever. Um, so just the ones that have textual content. And he's, um, I, so part of the reason I'm kind of jazzed up on this is because I recorded the interview with them today, which will become like the center part of the interview, the webinar, but then they'll be there live to answer questions um, and to be part of the discussion. So I wanted to make sure we got the information kind of organized and so that hopefully we can keep this to a really good hour long uh, webinar. And it won't just be information about this. At, at the end, it'll be like a, a taking action guide. Um, so like how to have a conversation about this, like what's an offensive place name, right? So in Spain, they're like, if you were part of the murderous Franco regime and you got your name on stuff, we're coming for your name, we're getting it off, right? So what's a parallel in California? What's a name? What's a group of people that got their name put on a lot of stuff that now missionaries or the yeah, priests? missionaries? Um, ironically, I had lunch with my nephew today in a restaurant called The Mission, and I was like, suddenly, kind of like, I need to write a letter to them and ask them to change. But, but so, like, that I think that's an important discussion for kids to have about like, where's the boundary? What's historical? What's derogatory? What is re traumatizing? what's worth changing. And so that could be a big, you know, in in one time in, in Spain, there was a lot of popular support for attaching these fascist names to things because they were proud of how they were, lead, you know, leading a civil war in the country. There was a group of people that were happy to commemorate that. And now there's pretty well unified opinion that they should. And so that that's something that when they bring it up, people are like, absolutely, I agree. Please show us where this is happening. Um, during the interview, he um, showed that he knows a lot more about American history than we know about Spanish history because he's like, well, for example, Robert E. Lee, here's how you would query the different ways that his name is presented. Anybody know what E is for? I didn't. Daniel Otto Paralias from Spain knew. This is the part where I was embarrassed. He's like, Edward, you put Edward, it's Edward with a W. I didn't know this. Um, and uh, so anyway, he, you know, he pulled up all the examples in Texas of streets named after Robert E. Lee. Um, and when you use the database, it shows you exactly what um, municipality and county they're in. So you can then just continue right on your Google search to figure out who you're writing a letter to or what the public meeting is, where you could raise awareness or oppose that place name. Um, they are also talking about like how you then go to um, advocacy groups and say, hey, we just learned this. You guys probably have been kind of angry about this place name for a while, huh? Oh, okay, well, let us help you change it and let us help you have a voice in what it gets changed to. 
So in California, for example, when they're removing the word squaw, um, a lot of times it's that's a derogatory name directed at indigenous women. What would the indigenous women prefer this place name to be? That's the one we're going to put forward. Um, so it's not just um, corrective, but it's uh, reconciliatory in, in that way. It's like, you know, it's anyway. So I think you get the point of, the, of what this is. There's two opportunities to attend. One is like a classroom connect, 10 to 11 a.m. Students, um, we're not setting any grade level. Uh, if you think your students are prepared for this conversation, um, by any means, bring them there. We will um, have opportunities if you register for that. And um, I will send an email with an opportunity for you to sign up to be to ask a question. I mean, to have one of your students preferably ask a question. Um, so that will be during the 10 to 11 portion. Then at four to five is like educators only. And what I'm gonna do there is keep the Zoom rooms open. Uh, somebody's gonna have to teach me how to make breakout rooms so that there can be breakout discussions. So this group um, could be a, one discussion group. I've invited the, Cal, uh, the UCLA History and Geography Project to like host an, a discussion group with teachers they work with. Um, if that's something of interest. So presumably any group that comes or, or, or even if a school that has several teachers attending and wants to have a follow-up discussion um, around the action steps, that would be very cool. So those are the two ways to register. Um, any questions about that? Can you put the link in the chatters? I can't seem to get it to the slides. Okay, let me see if I can. This sounds so cool. I think my fifth graders would really benefit I agree. My first learning, graders listening would love to these it. discussions, you know, hearing people talk about it that aren't just Mrs. Neal and like that academic language that some will go over their heads, but some will definitely be good for them. And I, so my original um, idea, huh, maybe that was that link being difficult because it's a, oh, it's not active in the slide. I'm so sorry. That's my bad. I've, uh, too, I was working too quickly. Um, are, you, are you doing too many things at once, Tom? <laughs> It sometimes happens. Um, that jet lag. <laughs> in our participation. I'm hopeful with any excuses. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna do something else because um, I will tell you right now, as of right now, I've been publicizing this for a while, and there's only three people registered. Wow. And I will not be happy if only three people are registered. Uh uh. Hi, Dara. So, is the kid just shared around school? Absolutely. Invite us. <laughs> um, so. I believe through the university account, I can have 250 mm -hmm. Zoom people wow, okay. at the um, webinar. So pack it, that would be totally awesome. Um, yeah. And that, and and so please do share widely. Like I said, we, it, we don't usually um, fill the large concert hall type venues when we're doing CJEP things as we're more uh, a boutique approach. Um, but I would love it if lots and lots of people came um, to this. And let me also put the link in there since um, the so link. If, if, Go ahead. Yeah, if I were to share it with the teachers at my school, what's the lowest grade level you'd think? Like prime, like fourth above or? Uh, I kind of, I would like to hear your guys' advice on that, to be honest. Yeah. What do you guys think? So, so Dara, you, you're a person who might have an opinion on this because of the grade level you teach. And so I just want to, did, did you catch what this is about? The webinar on the 13th, it's about removing the derogatory place names. I think it's great for fifth grade. I'm not sure my fifth graders are ready for it, but um, it could even, if, if a third grade class had been worked with, because right. of because a lot of people start some California history in third grade, definitely mm -hmm. fourth grade because you're studying a lot of geography in California. But again, I think it really depends on if a, if a class has been prepped um, mm -hmm. and it's been part of discussion. Whereas um, my situation this year is is a little tricky. It, just a lot of behavior management. We haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> 
I, been there, that, right? Yeah. That's exactly why I think individual teachers should consider that. Put that and, on, the um, on the form, I think when you get into the registration form, it, it has mm -hmm. a, a little bit of a position statement. And even if you notice on the um, slide, I mean, on the flyer, it's perfect on that. I, I was I'm cutting like, pasting that in. <laughs> it, to be honest, it kind of bothered me to share the link to the um, article because the first thing you see is this derogatory place name. Mm -hmm. um, and so that to me, it's a little like, oh, you can't miss it. You can't get past it. You can't get around it. Um, but but uh, Daniel from Spain, when I, I said, here's my thing, I put on this like, we're not going to say the words during this, like just to give some guidelines so what teachers would, would expect, you know, because you might have that question. But there's no way to say, for example, that this one that's blocked out is spook lane. Like right. if, are, if I say it's, you know, N word highway, people are gonna know what I'm talking about and that can make sense. But there's some ways, and, and Daniel's like, the point is that if you can't talk about it, you're actually just being silent and perpetuating it being there in the landscape and not calling it out. So his advice was to say, in this context, we're going to say it and and prepare people that we're, say, we're identifying it to take action against this. And so, uh, so that to me is that certainly in the four to five for educators, I'm not going to, you know, dance around the words, I will say them. Um, but even, I don't know, I just, my, for those of you that joined late, it was my mom's 89th birthday. I was back in DC and she appears on my shoulder if I was to actually utter the full N word. And it would be like a very disproving look. <laughs> like we were not allowed to get anywhere close to that in my house. And there would be like, I could rob a bank. I could do a lot of things that'd be less disappointing. So, so I will, they'll, I'm sure there'll still be words I won't be comfortable saying. Um, but there's also words that don't, that don't ring against that to me. So, hey, Tom, yes, one more thing. When I went to register, I can only choose one of the two, what, which option you're registering, either individual classroom or discussion. And I'd love to do classroom and discussion. I, you know I have to go in there and do it twice. Yes. One for the classroom and then because one for, yeah. It, yeah, you can complete the whole form twice. You can't. Yeah choose both buttons. I tried to make it so you could choose both. And then eventually I was like, maybe this is a good thing. So nobody accidentally registers for both. Uh, good point. And um, I think it's a good idea to separate them because maybe some people don't want to do the classroom. They want to do the educator yeah, or vice yeah. versa. I mean. Absolutely. And there's going to be resources. I mean, I found some really interesting things researching for this conversation I just had. Like, for example, the, the, the example I know about in San Diego, and I'll share this during the webinar, um, but there's this very amazing local character. His name's Nate Harrison. He is part of the California Gold Rush story. And he has a, like, a really unique story because he was an enslaved person brought from Alabama with, with it, by his owner with several other enslaved people to work in the gold rush. And that was actually a substantial amount of who was working in the gold rush. And we talk a lot about people came from Europe, people came from all these different places, but we don't often mention the fact that California, officially a free state, totally sanctioned slavery for dozens of years uh, and, and had no interest in um, telling a person who brought enslaved people into the state that that wasn't acceptable here. So, uh, so Nate Harrison remains enslaved until his owner dies. Then it's like, hey, they're homesteading. I'm going to go homestead, gets this um, homestead allotment, lives this colorful life. It's, it lives up on Palomar, not currently, did, lives on, lived on Palomar Mountain in San Diego County, this very rural area that became like a state park and a place that people went for um you know, recreation and relaxation and nature appreciation. And halfway up the mountain, they would stop at Nate Harrison's ranch 
and he would give them water and he would tell them stories and everybody loved Nate Harrison. He was very welcoming and they found him so interesting, the good people of San Diego, that they decided to call every single feature, the road, the canyon, the hill, everything N-word. N-word grade, N-word canyon, N-word peak, N-word creek, everything that Nate Harrison could see from his house got labeled with the most derogatory term in use for people of his racial um, category. And that stayed that way till the 1950s. So anytime that anybody was like, oh, is this, and they would go, is that why it's the road is named that way? Yes. Um, also, I was in um, Columbia, California, which is a gold rush site. Um, and some of you know um, Jessica Matthews or Emily Reynolds um, that are part of the Global uh, Teacher Fellowship. I was there doing a workshop and I used this um, tool called uh, Historical Topographic Map Viewer. I may have shared it with some of you guys. What's cool about it is you can look at your community and then look at every map that the federal government made of your community through time. So you can actually get a little snapshot of what it looked like in 1947 or what buildings and what roads or railroads were there in 1885 or something. So you can kind of roll back time. And I was showing people in a, luckily a teacher, not student included group, um, how, what a cool tool this was. And then zoomed in on a spot and went back from the 1950 map to the 1940s map and boom, there was the word again. There it is. Oh, that, that prominent little high point outside of town, N-Word Hill. That's what it was. And then you pull up the 1957 map and it turns to Negro Hill. And then they didn't ever rename it. So they just stopped putting it on the maps because they realized it was offensive. But it's still the official name. It's still in the name database. So that it's everywhere. It's incredible. Uh, so like I was doing a, a search on, on the word um, like the short version of raccoon. And uh, there was tons and tons and tons of uses. And I thought, well, that's a hard one. How do you prove it? Lots and lots of cases where they had documented the discussion at a city council. And it was actually the replacement, the agreed upon preferred replacement for that sequence I had just talked about from N-word to Negro to raccoon. So no doubt what's going on there. Yes, Dara. I just wanted to say to, uh, that it's even happened way out where I lived in the farthest reaches of Siskiyou County, and it was also a way to identify and um, uh, point out that somebody was living there, too. So um, yeah. it, it had the same pattern that you're talking about as well. So it was N Creek, and then it got um, it got changed to Negro Creek and then it's state it hasn't been changed yeah um and it also happened with i lived um on a place called t creek and it wasn't like it was t it was for charlie t so it was really important to the miners um so part of the history of the San river and klamath river was identifying who lived there and the names um so interesting they never got changed so i just i noticed that in my local area as well it once you notice it, you're like, like it almost like it was some kind of sick reflex. Just like every, like people must be warned. So name everything in the area, um, it, you know, to help identify them. So, so this is one, um, one of the workshops. I'm actually working on a second one, and I shared with you the the kind of motivation, um, but I can't. Um, and actually, if you go on the slides, this is the, the North American Street Names app that I was talking about that um, where, you know, you just typed in the United States. It's It's got U.S., Mexico and Canada, by the way. So if any Canadians are like, oh, you Americans, so racist. Trust me, they're not better. Um, and <laughs> and um, you would need Spanish speakers really to help you identify the patterns in Mexico. And, you know, and also French speakers for, for Quebec. 
Um, but you can uh, kind of play around with that and maybe investigate some of what's happening in your community. I forget the name of the Raiders in Humboldt. Okay. Loomis, you know, and what were they? No, no, no. Oh, that was not related. Um, but but that uh, in Humboldt, the the kind of group that was actively advertising their willingness to murder any number of natives in any village basically you just tell us where you don't have to do the word dirty work we're here to do that for you and those people are, are commemorated all over the place um i did not know uh the city of downey uh named after one of the early governors of california who is personally responsible for um orchestrating what is called in san diego the um the san diego trail of tears driving people out of uh, uh, a village on, on a ranch he had bought where the federal government had assured the people that as long as they maintain continuous occupation, they would not be displaced from their um, village. This guy buys the ranch with that condition attached, knows full well. He's the firm, former governor of California. He's pretty well versed in law and proceeds to hire a colonel in the U.S. Army to do an extra legal violent displacement of the group. And that's how the Pala Indian Reservation came to be in San Diego is that's where they got driven. So um, anyway, the second, not to digress, the second one that I'm still working on and I will get information, um, but just to recap, my justification for canceling our November meeting is to open up time in your schedule to participate in, in the one I just mentioned but also hopefully a very similar approach to this school uh, schoolyard tree canopy equity study. Lots of words. Oh my goodness, that's a cute kitten. Just had to look at the kitten a minute. Um, okay, so I mentioned this and we looked at the map briefly about how um, low the tree cover percentage is in, in so many schools um, and how few schools and only the um, wealthiest kind of enclaves of California and places also where the environment is conducive to lots of tree cover, experience um, something that's not an urban heat island. Basically, our school sites are urban heat islands by design. And the picture on the screen pretty illustrates the reason why. You can already, it feels hot just looking at the picture. Um, and same thing, I would like to have the folks who, who organized and conducted this study share what's going on. And then, um, and so that's why I can't announce it confirmed yet because I don't have that arranged. Um, but then there'll be an, an action step to go out in your school, um, schoolyard and do a ground truth. Like, okay, what did the study find for our school site? What's the percentage? Does that seem right? Maybe do some tree identification and then do some um, reimagining of the schoolyard landscape and what would it look like to create a more climate resilient, but also a more um, environmentally sensitive, uh, ecologically supportive schoolyard that might also be a really positive learning environment. So that's also gonna be happening on that same week. So I'm going to officially take our evening, November 13th meeting off the, calendar when we get off and and you are hereby invited for sure to the November 13 place names webinar and I'm expecting to put this one on either the 12th or the 14th so I'm leaving it open in hopes of of um, attracting the experts to come share with me cool all right so uh this stuff from the tree canopy study I'm going to stop sharing right now, and I'm going to turn over the mic to um, members of our group who are going to be treading into new territory for our, our meetings because we're going to start allocating time to hear about what you're thinking about, what you are planning on implementing, or maybe what you have implemented. All good. Um, just to share and have conversations with this group so that you guys as um, wise educators can help each other um, and learn from each other and that I can hear about it at the same time too. But um, 
you guys have all the all the know-how as teachers. So Renee, um, take it away. You should have power to share slides. Um, been so long since I've been blessed with doing this. Like I've got too many things open just like here. You want to see the the uh, file on my child's missing work today? <laughs> just let me close that. Just a sec. You possibly can see. Let's see. Sorry, I have it open, but I'm like just not seeing when I go to share. Just like, let me try this. I, I totally commiserate with this. Okay, good. <laughs> like, I used to be so good at this back in the day. Yeah, it's probably not showing up. Wait a sec here. Wait for it. It's like typing for me. I'm only good at it at the end of the meeting. And when the next meeting starts, I'm bad at it again. And then you're like, and now we've gone downhill again. Okay, yeah, I should be closing all the. So what I've been doing, I can just start telling you guys, is working on um, doing the geography with the kids. So I'm trying to tie it into the two projects I do. Uh, I'm starting with Brother Sam is Dead and trying to map the locations that we do in the American Revolution. And then I'm trying to put it together with. Um... Hey, no, no. All right, whoever's dog is misbehaving, you. Sorry. That was awesome. I'm like, yes, sorry. <laughs> if that's parenting, though, carry on. That totally is. That was amazing. Um, Yeah, so I've been trying to tie those two in. And so I created some slides to explain how I'm doing it and then to kind of walk through so people can see. Okay, let's see. This should work now. Let's see. I'm going to pull it out separately. Close that bad boy. Okay. All right. That's, I can see the CJEP math one. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why does it hate me? Uh, let's see here. I'm trying one more thing. And then, so I'm trying to, yeah, combine the two different things that I'm doing. So um, starting with Brother Sam is dead. And so having them map the different locations of the different battles as we go along, because we write a paper after we go through that. And then, um, then next tying it in at the end of the year with my state report. Um, and then using it throughout too, but those would be the two um, moments. Ah, here it is. Okay, here we go. All right. Can you guys see it? Did I win? See it? Brother Sam? All right, cool. We got it. Okay, so using those two texts and then the yearly fifth grade and then with the ArcGIS. So this is the student introduction. I said, enter stage left, the energy with it. So um, let the journey begin. So the story of Brother Sam is dead has multiple historical events from the American Revolution. Drama, battles, death, love, all in the historical time. It's a historical fiction. Many of them are made up, but they could have or even may have happened. So I tell the students, you get to keep track of the journey and make yourself a map as you go along. So the first step of your adventure leads you to blend technology and your textbook and the book Brother Sam is Dead. Afterwards, you're going to get more freedom with technology. During your state report, you'll find ways to illustrate and explain the different places of interest in your state using your amazing GIS skills. So prepare yourself if you dare. Get those tools ready, locate yourself in history, and let's begin our journey. And yes, you get to use technology. Because anytime I let them use their computers, they're quite excited. Okay, there you go. So I'm going to do, um, I'm going to say, I said, I've got time to take the kids on a journey to discover new technology just so they were sure they knew technology better than their teacher. So the one time we can actually introduce something that's possibly new to most of them. Um, so again, there's two points of access. So first I've got two documents that I've created. One is a student guide copy and it has the events in Brother Sam is Dead that you find already listed from the book with the dates attached. So they can use their ArcGIS tools to find the location with the book. And then the other one, there's one without the details. So as they read the book, they can be filling it in. Um, some of the dates are not provided in the book. So I've also got a teacher copy with all the dates, um, but also telling them to use your vetted online resources to be able to find the dates. And then once the document's completed, create a map using the tools and the software. And then great. Now you're sounding like a fifth grader, rubs off on us, doesn't it? How do I create this map? Um, so here are the steps. So I have the, how to create the an account with the school address. And then you click on make a story up here and then click on the link under start your story. So you're gonna click on the storymaps.arcgis. And then it says, wait, I'm not done yet. 
And so here's the, you're going to go to the guided map tour. So just the directions on how to do it so somebody can do it. And then there's your title the story and give it a short introduction. And then a cover images from the websites I've got provided on this document. And then you're going to scroll down to add events. And it's all in here. And then you'll click save. So you'll get something that looks like this. Um, you may need to Google the location. Like I said, some of them, it's going to be this battle happened. Where was it? So that you can actually add it in here. Um, and then there's a few key details. If you have an image, you have to save it to your computer first before adding it to the story map. Always confirm your copyright for the images. Make sure you're okay sharing them. I said, if the perfect images can't be found, they can use similar images. So in Brother Sam is Dead, he returns home with news about the battle. So like I said, I'll show you the document. But one of those moments is he talks about the battles at Lexington and Concord and goes into great detail. And so he's at the tavern. So I was trying to find a picture of a tavern from them. And I wasn't able to find a picture of a tavern, but I found a picture of like a different type of little house. So I put that in there. So I'm telling the kids, like, don't get caught up in that. And then I said, carry on, culminate and ruminate. Continue using it throughout the year. Culminating the project with the GIS during the fifth grade report. And then here's the report that I give the students. I have a student document, then a teacher document. And it says, what a busy person you are. So much traveling and so little time. I hope your head isn't spinning too much. Time to take a break from the exciting world of research and writing. I know collective groan of sadness because they have three papers they have to write. We're off to the world of GIS again. Similar to the last project, I want you to find all the locations that are used in your three papers. You will show them in three different ways. First, your historical paper. Use each of the sites you visit. Connect them to the story map in chronological historical order. So I'm teaching them how to make the lines to connect the stories. Second, your narrative play paper. You're going to connect the places of interest throughout the state. So you're going to show the path your person followed. Um, this might lead you to reflect and see if your character actually followed the most efficient path. And then third, but not least, your places of interest persuasive paragraph. Just link those in the order you list them. Check was there an implicit bias in the ones you mentioned first? Were they most interesting to you? And so I'm not to the point yet where I've been able to have the students do this. I'm working on it right now, um, but that's my plan and that's what I'm presenting to them. And they've been using the tools. I tried to use the National Geographic one first and it just was kind of kludgy. And so with the ArcGIS, it seems to be working much better for the kiddos. It just took me a little while to get the permission from the school to use it. Um, but they've been having a great time finding stuff. And you know, we're just starting Brother Sam is Dead um, on Monday. So I've got the plan. I've got the kids already introduced to the tool. And then I have three different documents too. I have a teacher's guide to it and then a student guide that they can do. And that's where I'm at. And I can show you those two in a minute. So link those. Excellent. Thank you for sharing and for being the brave first volunteer. Uh, <laughs> any open up to the floor, any questions, comments? I really like. I'm the sorry. Way you, oh, okay. Sorry, Michelle. No, no, that's answer? okay. I well, I just I wanted just to ask about the time frame. I don't. I mm -hmm. I think I might have missed that. It's kind of all year because it's going to start in the beginning with Brother Sam, um, and that document I have is much shorter, and then our state reports at the end. So it's the introduction, and I have a document that introduces them to everything and how to use it, and then getting them used to it, and then however you can kind of integrate it throughout the year. And then I do this huge state report at the end. And that would kind of be my, have you figured this out yet? Okay. That's what you were talking about. Two moments, right? Okay. I'm yes, like, I get exactly. it now. Right. So, so, and, and, and in each case, what you're really doing mm -hmm. is taking something that, that you were already doing and adding like a geocomputational element, an, an additional. Exactly. Action. Okay, cool. So they have that spatial awareness to go with what they're already doing. Right. Like here, I can show you. Yeah, I've got, um, I found it finally. I've got the document that I create for the teachers here. Um, so part one, Brother Sam is dead, references multiple historical. So here's, and again, I have a student guide copy. It's another paper I have. Um, so I have two, one with dates, one without dates for them to look through. And then here's the directions on the three papers we do and how we do them and then having them integrate. So, and like I said, I have other documents too with that. So, because I wanted to make it as clear for the teachers in that way. I think I'm good. <laughs> Thank you, Renee. That was really amazing.
And I'm a fifth grade teacher. So of course I want to use all your things now. <laughs> totally. Oh my gosh. And let me know when you change them. Cause I haven't used it yet. So until you use it, you don't have it totally, you know, figured out. It's say like, in theory, this will work. Well, I think the fact that you're giving it to the students, you're giving direction, but you're also allowing that creativity. You're yes. going to see what comes out of that because sometimes we create a lesson and we really don't know until we let our students kind of get their that's, hands on it. And then that's how you'll be able to modify it because you're right. going to see the outcome of that. that. I think that's great. And the way you incorporated everything. And I love the fact that they're going to be creating this on their own and then, you know, going off of that because yeah, that's, that's good. Great job, Renee. Thank you. It should be fun. I hope. Yeah. See, like I, I said, I have brother Sam is dead. I have all the dates. I have a document with everything in it. Um, a key for teachers, then one, I can show you quickly. And then one with dates for the students and one without dates. So here's a timeline of events through the story that they should be able to find and find locations for. And then, um, so it goes all the way through here with the different events. I kind of clump things together as the kids would. And then again, I have this document for just kids to fill out either. That's the teacher's guide. And then I have the document with kids with just dates. And then I have the document for kids without the dates to see like the higher level kids that you want to push to go find stuff. So yeah, it should be fun. I hope I can do it I with 33 kids. I think it's awesome. Yeah. I do something like that with my kids too with awesome. uh, elephant run we've done it the last few years and then this year the all the books have disappeared so the whole class set is gone um and Why? we cannot find them anywhere <laughs> so now i'm struggling because i need to find another book that we have and i want to do the same thing um yes. but we should have started it by now and i'm stressing out because the books have disappeared um, i always start the year with Hannes and me a baseball story and then i go into it see i do sixth grade we've already read three novels but sixth. i need to like Jeez. I need to find something that has geo interesting places to right. with historical right. significance. Yeah, so Elephant Run was World War Two, so there was lots. Oh, of things, okay. But, um, yeah, that's why I don't know in fifth grade. I'm like, I've never read that in fifth. Should I look. Yeah, into they it? end up in Burma, and there's elephants, and it's very cool. It's a cool story. The kids love it, and it's historical fiction. Um, so totally depressed, but I also add art into mine too. So they learn about like Andy Warhol and they do an elephant painting and we put that in the story map. So it's cool to like kind of add some other elements in there too. No, so I, I know there's a book called, um, we kind of stumbled on it. Um, Kate the Capello, I think is the author. It's called, um, one eye Charlie and okay. it's during the, um, uh, Pony Express and it, it's a female that, uh, portrays to be a man but it talks about oh, her yeah. you know how she was able to travel from one location to another during the um oh gosh I just I just threw a blank um the Pony Express thank so, you yeah, I want to like look at it it's it's a really the we stumbled on it we read it and the kids were so into it because you I know I was hoping to use a set that I already have at school <laughs> so oh, I don't have to try yeah. to find funds for another class set yeah. but I have to figure out um, what else we have access to that I can, has anything interesting? It's a map. <laughs> One of my wife's favorite stories about when I tried them. Yeah, that was really good. We oh. just stumbled on it. We, cause I think I had purchased some books through Scholastic and that was one of the free books that they give the teachers. And I thought, oh, I'm going to read something different. And the kids loved it. And it tied into California history, you know, the, the Pony Express. So it was a good, it's a really good, it's That's based on a true story too. This is writing freedom, right? That book. Uh, is it writing freedom? Yeah, I've heard that. Uh, writing freedom. Oh, that's a really good one too. But no, this one is yeah. So maybe same story, different book. And and I don't know the book either. Um, so, and it's interesting if you do a quick Google, Google search, it says there's no known female Pony Express writers. But um, so maybe this, maybe I'm combining the stories, but there was a state, uh, uh, I believe it was a Wells Fargo stage. Yes, it um, is. That she started uh, working with first. And, and, and then they didn't discover that she was female until she died. That was at the very end. Yeah. And I think she got injured and then ended up having her own company. She lost an eye. That's why it's called One Eye Charlie. Okay. Well, awesome. Uh, other other comments or questions for Renee? I yeah, I have one, Renee. I'm um 
I was wondering with this project, um, like I'm trying to really understand the UDL design with this. Am I saying that or ULD? ULD design. Um, I'm trying to figure out, like, uh, do you have a minimum number of dates that students will put on their story map? And then those other students that want to delve in further would, would like build on that? I don't have the minimum. The UDL part of it would be that because I've got all the events kind of listed and we'll go through them as they go along. So we'll discuss it, of course, during the story too and be writing it in our notebooks. Um, but that's why I have it just for the kids that can't dig it out. I have a document with them already listed. And then the kids who can go dig it out. I have the document with like um, with a couple of them listed to kind of keep couching things and see what they can find. Um, but that's exactly what my concern was. And then I have another one with them just with the dates where they can find it and put the things in too. So yeah, because there's going to be so many different levels of access that are in my classroom. I mean, of my 33 kids, 32 kids, there's so much going on. So that's, that was my goal. Um, it still might be, there still might be much better ways to have access, you know, as we go along, but that was my basic thought. So if you have any other ideas, let me know, Michelle, too. <laughs> I'll always take stuff. Well, I'm still learning, but that's why I'm, I kind of am like processing in my head, like, oh, what are some other ideas? So I'll let you know if I think yeah. of something. <laughs> Yay, thank you. I'd love it. <laughs> yeah. And it's cool that um, you've got Nicole as a resource because she's done similar projects like this before. And and um, maybe other people can use this, um, this approach or this same specific um, story. But I here, so here's my comment, and if, unless anybody else has something and you can jump in after. Um, but I love that you're jumping in with um, solving the technology. You, you understand that your students are excited and interested to use the technology, and so that's attractive to them. And even though it's a complication and a task for you <laughs> to figure out what's going to work, you're doing that. So thank you and congratulations for being willing to do that. Um, and then by using story maps, and I agree that that there's reasons I think that's better than the Nat Geo map maker. And, and especially in terms of the students being able to save and, and progressively work on and then um, share even like with folks at home, if you wanted to publish them, that's that's super cool. But the story maps do one thing, they, they really help you um, you know, you're using geospatial technology to help people tell a story in geographic space, right? So they're act, they're kind of putting that story onto a map or, or pulling data points out, but it's also very narrative in nature what a story map is. So as Nicole pointed out, you can put different components in there, um, images that the kids collect, images that they produce, um, videos, things like that, sounds. But also think about maybe as they're categorizing these locations, thinking about variables. Like what, what are a couple of variables that they could include in the pop-up for each one of those locations? So like in terms of the narrative, it might be which characters were present in this location, because maybe it's not all the characters. Or maybe it's, uh, was this, uh, you know, before, during, or after the main action of the story? I'm just making things up but you know just something to get the students thinking about categories um variables data and putting and organizing their information and so even just coming up with an idea that each and that might help them put text into those pop-ups by saying you know say what the place is where you know where it comes up in the story and then you know put these three fill these three blanks in that so that's my only idea and again uh, caveat is I have no idea what fifth graders can do. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even know. That's the thing. Like you start going places and oh my goodness. Right. And you know, another thing to think about Renee is um, maybe doing more than one map too. So like when That's we do- That's what I was actually thinking as Tom was saying that. Yeah, we, we do yeah. our map for yeah. the locations that the kid traveled. And then we do, they have to do a like a research paper on elephants used during war because I'm ancient history right. and then they Lucky yeah you. and then they have to do pop-ups for the how they were used and stuff and then they have to write an opinion paper like this so that's all one of mine. Yes. map is yeah. should elephants be used in war 
which is, you know, really kind of chaotic, but, <laughs> but that's yeah. after they like looked at different points in history when elephants were used in war. So they have multiple maps in their story map. So you can do that. You can combine multiple maps in like one, because I'm still new, like. Well, no, they just are in different places. So like when you're, doing your, when you're doing your story yeah. map, they first you talk about the battles or whatever the character is going right. through with map parallel to it. And then you get to the next section and now they have their opinion paper about elephants and they have okay. a map of all the different ways elephants have been used in war. Oh, that's even better. Cause that's what I was trying to figure out how the data wouldn't overlap or would. That's the nice part about the story map is it's fluid. So it, you know, it can kind of change subjects. Right. And you could have a section like you were describing, that's almost like a tour. So it's a chronological from this place uh -huh. to that place. And then leave that map behind and insert another section that inner you know just presents a new map with new data i hadn't found that yet the inserting is okay it's it's all a process so you know it's a great process and i told the kids i said we're gonna do something awesome i've never done and just so you know you're gonna teach with me but i like i said i'm super proud kids because it's technology you don't know huh. cool well, Until the kids are going to say, I do, Mrs. Neal. We'll see. I'm, I'm introducing, like I said, Monday. <laughs> my so, hubris may be my undoing. <laughs> well, I want to share it with my neighbor, who's a fifth grade teacher, so that I can get her kids to know it before they get to me. So Brilliant. I've been trying to get, I have a new fifth grade partner. And so I think that there's hope with this one. She might actually glom onto it. And if they already read Brother Sam, my brother Sam is dead. So it might be easy to just be like, hey, look at it. <laughs> something already ready for you. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, this is an incredibly um, good example. I didn't expect it to get this um, good. It's an example of what the point of the sharing is. So for everybody to hear and get excited about what you're doing, to share their ideas, and then also to um, maybe see that there's an opportunity to double the value in what you're doing by sharing it with another teacher um, or more, maybe more than double. So, so cool. should I create a folder for Tom with all the stuff and then just share it with everybody. Is that the easiest way to do the Google folder? That would or? be great. Yeah, you could put um, a folder in our participant folder. Perfect. Um, and you can, you know, label it however you think makes it um, easy for people to understand, you know, your name or, or your uh, shorthand version of your project. Perfect. Yay, thank you. This has okay. been fun. Thank you, Tom. I was telling Dan, my husband, I'm like, I wouldn't be doing all this stuff if it weren't for Tom. Like, I just don't have the energy. But then you find the energy and then it energizes your teaching. So it's good for me after all these years to be energized. So excellent. Excellent. Good. Thank you for being the first. And and Blanca, we have time for you to share if you would like. So so I took on um, this summer, I, I did a professional development through Glen County Office of Ed. It was called um, uh, Looking at the Lens of a Native Perspective. And so it's all standard-based and the um, group is called Red Bud and they're out of Clear Lake and they presented all the lessons to us and they have all the lessons laid out and you just kind of do the lessons um, with the Native Perspective lens. And so we've gotten to, a uh, like we are in the third lesson. The kids are really enjoying it. So I'm going to share what we've done so far and with geography incorporated in there. And I've also um, doing it with my grade level partner. And because I am dual immersion, I have incorporated other activities into the lessons themselves. So I'll share and hopefully excuse my thousand tabs that I have open. Um, okay, let me see. We see that. So I'll share what we've done so far with the lessons and then I will also create a folder um, so I can share these resources with you guys. And this is, um, it's it kind of lends itself. So the group itself lends itself. The training I did was for fourth grade because it's fourth grade history, but they also have fifth grade middle school lessons within this resource. So the name of the um, group is called Red Bud and the lesson is called Native Perspectives Everyday Lessons. And so what they do is this is to help your students build relationships with the place they live. And so it has all of these lessons that are like kind of embed one after the other. So the first lesson is just really um, presenting the three R's and it lays it down where it shows a picture. They give you a slideshow, the, the teacher 
Um, lessons are already created for you. The slideshows are already embedded. Any videos, any activity sheets, um, which is really cool. And then, um, for example, so you present the three R's and the three R's are um, what they go based off. Let me see if it's going to let me open it. Um, it's uh, so they give you a slideshow and then also you go off of your um, teacher notes. And so for this one is the first thing you do is you introduce the three R's. So the three R's, it just shows them a, a little picture. Um, and then you have a discussion of what the picture is showing. And the kids discuss that and it shows the second picture. And then once we have the discussion about the pictures, we go over what each of the R's represent. So, you know, it goes into respect, um, the formal definition of having due regard for the feelings, wishes, rights, or traditions of being in a community. What are some other words we can use to describe the meaning of respect? And we get into that. And that happens to be at our school. It's one of our expectations. So that one was a big one. And then it goes into uh, receipt. And I always say this one wrong. So re, the kids say it better than that. Reciprocity. And then the third one is relationships. And all of it is embedded in all of the lessons that we do. Okay. So we started off with this one. And then it goes into all the books that they present in videos are native people. So the first book that we introduced and um, GCOE has the copy of all these books. So we were able to get a book for the classroom. It's called Berry Song and it's about um, the land. It's about a little girl and her grandmother. They're native and they talk about the land and how the three R's represent that land. Um, and so you, you listen to the story, then you have a discussion. There's an art um, component that goes along with it. And then there's also an answer sheet um that they answer and so they have a worksheet that goes along with it so then after they watch um we read the book then they watch the video then they have to answer some questions about the actual um the book and i i was able to put my students into pairs and have them work together um and i made sure that when i paired them up that i had kids that were a little bit you know like um, my lower kids with somebody that was higher or my mids um, make sure that I combine them correctly so they could help each other out. And then from there, we went into there's always a reflection exercise. Um, this one kind of went into um, after the, they had to get a worksheet and then they had to write in a small circle. And I don't know why my thing is so big. Let me see if I can make it smaller. Um, in, a, in the group that they were in, they also had to go in and talk about what the three R's were. And then they had to draw around this circle the places that they had visited with their friends and family, um, and also uh, the place that they can um, not imagine living without. So it makes them think about you know things that they they they, they really um, appreciate, and also looking at uh, gratefulness. And then so they fill this circle, and then we we shared it. And then after that, you move into lesson two, and this one I really liked because it really incorporated geography into this one. So this one is understanding where we live. Um, and so this one goes into the land. And what the kids had to do is um, when, so there's the presentation of where do we live. And before we even started into this, I had the kids go in and really research Hamilton City and what native um, tribes lived within the area and who they were. But this one kind of presents the lesson, understanding where we live, and then it shows maps of what it is right now and what it was when it was tribal land. And it also shows all the different languages that were spoken, and then it compares the two. How has it changed? What is the same? What has changed? What is different and why? So you have to kind of answer those questions. And then we go into, um, they had a little video where it was kind of where they had the kids close their eyes and start removing things little by little, like, okay, let's remove yourself from the classroom. Let's remove the streets. Let's remove everything around you. Now you're in this land, what does it look like? And so they had to visualize, and then afterwards they did a little um, writing prompt. And, and when you think about the land where you live, what comes to mind? So this is after the exercise. And then they go into the ancestral part of um, the land. They also talk about the territories, um, they go into the colonization, how it changed the land. 
Um, we go into a little bit of the gold rush. Um, it talks about tribal nations and what they are. And then it went into time and, and memorials and what those are. So some of the land that we're on is, you know, is sacred land. And then from there, um, they do have to do an activity where they actually have to go into Google Maps. And what they do is they have to go into Google Maps and search uh, the bar of all of these different areas around Hamilton City. And so they go in and they have to name them and label them. And then after that, they get a second worksheet. And on this worksheet, um, oops, sorry, wrong one, wrong one, wrong one. Sorry, 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 sorry. We're still in the same one. Um, they had to cut out these um, areas that they found on the map, and then they had to place them on a separate page with their home. They had to draw their home and then put where do these belong in the map. I'm trying to see where that worksheet is, but I don't. Let me see if it's in the slideshow. Um, so they had to draw their house, and then after they, um, oops, the wrong one. After they drew their home, they had to go in um, and draw where the lo the location of these places were. So I think it's da, 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 da. I think it's this one. Sorry, you guys. But if this one doesn't open it, I'll show you what that looked like because I have actual student work. Okay, it's not gonna do that. So I'm gonna go into the slideshow. So um, on this one, what we had to do is. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys, I have like a million things open and I got to figure out. I thought I had this under control, but I guess I didn't. Give me a second. Give me a second. Nope. Oh, my God. I have a million things going on, too. OK, so give me a second. Let me see if I can find that. Let me close some tabs and hopefully it'll pop up. So what they had to do is they had to draw a picture of their home and then they had to go in and. Um, put where these locations were on the Corno, um location. And so where would you find an uh, Indian tribe? Where would you find the lake? Where would you find? And the names on the worksheet were, okay, so you guys are gonna have to forgive me for this. Let me go in because I had it opened and for some reason now I don't. It kind of closed on me. So here it is, okay. Um, kind of loving the Redbud resource group, I have to say. Yeah, and so I'm going to put that on the thing, but it's really easy to get to it. And then once you're in there, you can pick the lessons. And they did do a whole lesson on genocide also, but that's more for upper grades, like sixth or eighth. And they also did a lesson on the gold rush. So it's all these lessons that are embedded within and the lessons are there. But now I can't find my other one that I opened. I'm sorry, you guys to show you my student work of some of the work that the kids did. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Give me just a second. If, if not, we will totally put you on for the next time in December. Oh, man, this so. sucks. I had it open too, but as soon as I started opening all the all of these other tabs, I don't know where it went because I have a million tabs, you guys. Um, let me see if I can bring it up. I know I had it up and running, so I don't know where it went. I thought it was this one, but let me see if I could close this one and see if maybe if I close some of these, it'll pop up. So we also had to do at the end of the activity, we had to do a land acknowledgement. Um, and so the kids had to go in and um, do a land acknowledgement to see why um, the land that they're on, why it's considered sacred, why it's meaningful. OK, I think I found it, Tom. I think it was next to your slides. OK, so there it is. Sorry, you guys. So um, in the lesson that I presented, uh, the kids had to also do at the end of the actual lesson. So. By the end of the lesson, what they did is the, um, they had to draw their home in the middle. And then the cardinal um, locations were written in native Homo um, language, and they had to write them in English or Spanish. And then they had to put the location of the places that they found nearby or where they would go on the map. And then after that, we did do a land acknowledgement. And what I'm going to do extending this actual lesson is what I'm planning on doing is having the kids pick one of the locations on the map and really research why that location, um, how it became about, what's the history behind it, who were the native tribes that um, were like getting some of the resources from this area, why is this area important. Um, so before we move on to the following lesson, and I guess at the end of um, the presenting all of the lessons, what we're going to end up doing is 
Instead of doing missions, we're gonna end up doing a project that Redbud has created for this lesson, where instead of doing the missions, the kids are gonna focus on some of the native tribes instead and do a whole project around that. So yeah, that's kind of what I've been diving into and um, as much as I can incorporating, um, and we're still following along, um, Tom, with this one, where the kids are creating a map of Hamilton City and really looking at the land of Hamilton, how Hamilton City came about. What was there before things were created? What is around them? Um, what is their neighborhood look like, you know, where they live? Um, and knowing, you know, the important locations around Hamilton City. It's a small town, but you'd be surprised how many of the kids really don't know anything about the town and, um, it's a sort of content and how the, the little town came about and why it is the way it is. And it hasn't like um, grown as much as we would want it to. Um, but it, we're going to go into that also. Are you sure you so, want it to grow? Come on now. Let's have yeah. some yeah. like discussion about what amount of growth you really what want. Amount of, and, and also, <laughs> I think the question to ask is, what would it take for this little town to have growth? And to be able to bring, because they've always asked, why can't we bring like a like a Walmart into town? Well, let's look at why a Walmart would not, why a Walmart wouldn't come here. We did get a Dollar General. <laughs> so, I mean, we're moving up in the world, but it, it is a small little town. There's not a lot there. And the interesting thing is when we did this last year, one of the questions that was asked in the survey was, which of the places in Hamilton City is the most important? And everybody said Toro Loco. It's a little... Grow, it's a little market where they sell every kind of Mexican product, the best meat, <laughs> um, seasoned meat. and But to them, that was well, important. Blanca, I don't mean to jump in now, no, I mean, no, no. but uh, this is a really cool resource you found. I, oh, I, my, you guys, it's <laughs> endless and it's I, And everything. I think it's very geocomputation. You know, at first mm -hmm. I was like, hmm, well, we're, how are we going to add in the geocomputation? Oh, no, no, yeah, it's, but, yeah. but it is. It's got the it's got the categories of types mm -hmm. of places. It's got the orientation mm -hmm. that initial mission statement is totally awesome. Yes. Wouldn't it be great though to have the conversation about what's the benefit of growth in our town? What's important about growth? And then go through that mental exercise. You've described it to me before about take the school away, take the highway away, mm -hmm. take the um, Toro Loco away, take the um, Dollar General away again. Like, yeah. and now picture that Hamilton without even Hamilton what's what do you really want to grow because yeah. they might go oh well actually the native perspective is they want the plants to grow they want the animals that depend on that environment to be healthy and to those communities to grow and actually we could do without a walmart because you know we we can already get yeah we can already see why that so anyway i think that's great but also then um another extension i would suggest is using uh, a resource um like the the living atlas of the world or mm. some other thing because i think that when people um and this isn't just your kids your kids i i don't know that well um other than from you but mm -hmm. people i know and you try and get them to think about that world without it they don't know yeah they don't they haven't been looking at places without all that human footprint and so to be able to use because uh a a GIS layer that just shows hydrology or just shows um, vegetation type. It is just the land. You can basically say, turn off the cities, turn off the highways, show me something that helps me understand what the land is. So mm -hmm. they can understand the slopes. They can understand the, the vegetation that's trying to grow there. They can understand um, you know, the, the native populations that, um, are connected to those lands. So I would, I would also encourage that, but no notes really on what the Redwood, yeah. uh, resource group, those are really cool lessons. And I, and then, you know, so. Yeah. And the lessons, you know, they're already created and they're really open to modification. Like I've had to do some modifications because it is a, a dual immersion classroom. And so I've even incorporated some art. I'm having some Machupta tribe members come and speak to the kids and do an actual lesson. I think they said they're going to do um, some jewelry and maybe some basket weaving. So I'm trying to incorporate as much as I can so the kids are exposed because, you know, there's just a lot we don't know. 
Um, and a lot of um, just really looking at the different perspectives, like this is a native perspective, and then really looking at our history books, so whose perspective is that too, um, when we look at history. So yeah, it's it's been great. And I will include that in the folder with this website. And I know there's a great one because I attended it, but it was more um, towards uh, sixth to eighth grade, but it was on the genocide and um, how they were, how the government and during the gold rush, how they eliminated a lot of the tribes and why and how this was done. It's actually really sad, but it's it's good history. Government financed. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why when I'm at the Ca California Council for the Social Studies and people talk about teaching their students about genocide, I'll say, which ones are you teaching them about? Because yeah. don't locate that as something that happened in another part of the world without identifying it's actually the reason we're all here eating well and having high property values and mm -hmm. you know things like that that are California's famous for. Any comments or questions? I yeah, know any questions at time, but if if you have ideas or suggestions or responses to Blanca. I just love that you're integrating, like bringing people in too. So you have their story and all this through that awesome resource you found. But then that you're also tying in, like having them come create things with the kids and talk to the kids, and just be a presence. That's That takes a lot of effort on your part to reach out, find people that can come in and stuff like that. And the kids are really lucky. That'll be a really neat thing. Yeah, and you know what? It's it's more that the reaching out, people are willing and wanting. Yes. But it's just we when we don't know these resources are available, like the, when I took this, it was an eye opener. And yeah. just being, our community is full of resources. We just don't know how to reach it because we don't know about it. Um, we well, so, also yeah, took the this time. Is great. And, and also within the lessons, they have videos of mm -hmm. actual Native people that are talking about it or doing field trips and talking about nature and the forest. So it's really cool. Well, uh, another um, excellent uh, sample reporting because um, we heard from Renee about how she's building something for her students and willing to share it. In this case, you're finding something that's out there that's got this good value and you're adapting it with the, the dual language component. And like Renee said, bringing, bringing other resources in to connect with that. So um, that's great. I'm super happy if we can help um, relay that resource out to people and help more people find it and make use of it. Because I, I that's a lot of the kind of basic components of geocomputational thinking that I've been encouraging, um, which means doesn't have to have computers at all. Um, but that's why I was saying at the end, maybe showing students how when they're thinking about raw nature and the place that they should feel connected to, there's this way that technology can help them kind of peel back the layers and see into what's really happening in that landscape and get to know it. And it also incorporates in some of the field trips that we're going to be taking when they talk about the native plants and why they're there. They're also going to talk about which of the tribes um, and why those native plants were important and what they were used for, because a lot of them were from medicinal. Um, and so I think it's going to all tie in to everything that we're doing, which is great. And so they'll, they'll see the connection of everything. Excellent. Any any other comments or ideas to share? All right. I think we're feeling tired. Middle of the week. So you guys did a great job of sharing. Um, for those of you who came during um, and did not hear the earlier discussion, we are not going to have our normal November meeting. It, it should disappear from your Google Calendar if you're using a Google Calendar. Um, and I... Um, suggested an alternative activity, which I will try and move my slide to this one, uh, a, a webinar on that same day. So um, this is an opportunity for you to register with your students or just attend on your own or with other teachers at the four o'clock time slot. So just wanted to make sure um, not to sign off without mentioning that we're not meeting during our regular time slot alternate activities for november for geography awareness week um and i hope you guys will all be able to to check that out um okay wait chat something came through in the chat 
I, oh, I just put the website, but I'll put it in the folder too, Tom. So if anybody wants to go and explore the actual Red Bud resource group, they have a ton of information for all grade levels. So if you Excellent. guys want to go and, and well, like Renee was saying, um, if you just create a folder and maybe so if there's any additional stuff that you um, create or just adapted versions of the materials that you've created for your dual language learners, that would be great to, to have that. Um, cool. All right, well then, without um, further ado, I'm gonna say uh, goodbye for the evening. I will point